desk at the present time does not precisely mirror the federal law. It doesn't mirror it in a couple of ways, uh, particularly uh, allowing uh, the First Amendment to be asserted in the private litigation between parties or the reliance upon the, uh, uh, the state law and, and those claims. Therefore, I ask that changes to be made in the legislation. And I've asked that the leaders of the General Assembly to recall the bill so that it can be amended to reflect the terms of the Federal uh, Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. Uh, in the alternative, it can be simply have some language changes so that those uh, uh, accommodations and changes can be made. So it either be done by recalling the legislation or having additional legislation that would accomplish those changes. Again, uh, this is difference between the executive branch, the legislative branch. We all have our responsibilities. We all have our different viewpoints. My responsibility is to speak out on my own convictions and to do what I can as governor to make sure this bill reflects the values of the people of Arkansas. All right, that was the governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson. Sorry about the audio, a little crackly there, but obviously speaking out about the bill that he decided to veto so as to not go through what Mike Pence has been through in the last week or so. And uh, here to discuss and debate this issue, we have Lori Windham, is the senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and she has worked on cases like the Free Exercise Clause, Establishment Clause, etc., and state religious freedom laws. And Brian Claypool is a civil rights attorney, arbitrated more than 100 cases, and uh, welcome both of you to the program. Hey, Sean, thanks for having us on. You know, as Asa pointed out, and I had the one of the authors of the 93 law on TV last night, Lori, is, and, you know, basically the law in Indiana, with very little distinction, is very similar to what President Obama uh, signed on to in the state of Illinois in the bill, the federal bill that, that Bill Clinton signed on to in 93. Why has this all of a sudden become a big, huge, controversial issue in society? You know, I think that's a great question. I'd add, I'd add that Ted Kennedy and Chuck Schumer co-sponsored that bill that President Clinton signed. Uh, so this is something that's been on the books for a long time. The sky hasn't fallen in the last 20 years. I don't think it's going to fall tomorrow. Uh, and it's very sad to see that we have this breakdown of the broad bipartisan coalition that used to stand strongly in support of religious freedom. And there's nothing in this bill, Brian, that even talks about gay rights. It's talking specifically about the Indiana bill and the Arkansas bill, correct? Right, right. But, Sean, I think, I think the problem here, though, is nobody's talking about what really spawned the federal law that, that Clinton signed in 1993. The, the, the laws that are being enacted by, by 20 states now, including Indiana and Arkansas, don't mirror the proper context in which Clinton signed this well, law. Right, now, now, you're talking about, well, st this is a very clever argument that I've been listening to a lot of you liberal lawyers make, and that is, well, you have to have the context, not the specific wording of the bill, because they're almost identical. And that's problematic for your argument, so you have to go back no. and talk about the context under which the bill was presented at the time. But that's not, that's not how, how we interpret laws in our... Uh, from our Sean, judicial branch, Sean, the law is being the law as it's as it, as it's as it's articulated now in Indiana and probably in Arkansas. No, Arkansas, not, whoa, finish, Arkansas mirrors the federal bill of '93, the, the bill but, Clinton signed but on to. Federal bill, Sean, had nothing to do with discriminating against gay. Neither does the bill in Arkansas. Yes, it does. They asked Pence point blank, does this law prohibit people from discriminating against gays and lesbians? He couldn't answer that question. No, he was no, that's not true at all because he was on this program yesterday and went into great specific detail about this and the reason he's putting the fix in the bill because it was never designed to be the way liberals like you have interpreted it. Well, it, well, the have you had discussions with guests about the Establishment Clause? Okay, well? now let me ask you the question. I'm the, I'm yeah. the questioner here. You bet. Okay? Here's on. a simple case. Do you believe in the First Amendment? 
of course. And do you believe in religious liberty and freedom? Yes. And do you believe that the government shouldn't have the right to contradict the religious, deeply held religious views of individuals? Well, I, I, I believe I, the government should not. That's be... a simple question. Yes well, or no to quote George Stephanopoulos. That's a yes or no question. OK, yes. OK, yes. so the government does not have the right to interfere in people's deeply held religious views, right? Right. OK, so when you have the government forcing Catholic charities and Catholic hospitals to provide birth control on the morning after pill, that would be a violation of that church's deeply held religious conviction, wouldn't it? That's that's a deeply held religious conviction. So that would be a violation. In other words, the government would be violating the deeply held religious conviction of the Catholic Church. But that I, wait, I, whoa, I whoa, no, 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 yeah. because now we're talking about yeah, sure. the need for this religious liberty bill. Mm -hmm. So if the government can can try and attempt to force Catholic charities, Catholic hospitals, the Sisters of the Poor, and others to provide birth control coverage and the morning after pill coverage. So now these laws are designed that, no, the government shouldn't have the right to impose on First Amendment religious liberty, should they? The issue is... No, no, no. I'm at the, follow my argument here. I'm following your argument. Should the government have the right to impose their values that circumvent the religious values of these groups? If, 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 if a religious conviction or belief is substantially impaired and there, and there, there is a compelling, is not a compelling state interest... Then, then, then your answer is yes. You can't look at it in a vacuum. All right, That's my point. But my point to you is there's a need for this religious liberty law based on your own interpretation of, of the Obamacare health law that forced Catholic charities to go against the deeply held convictions, right? Yes, but a very right, narrow, now, a very now, narrow now, let, now, let's take the example narrow. that everybody wants to go to, even though I don't know a single baker that would turn down bacon a cake for anybody that wants a cake, okay? But a gay couple wants to get married. And it goes against the deeply held religious convictions of that baker because he thinks that it is it, it contradicts his religious views, whatever his religion happens to be. Religion, A will say, mm -hmm. does he will the government then compel him to bake that cake for people or does he have the, the First Amendment right? not to bake the cake and follow his deeply held religious conviction that's what's at issue here if that's the the hypothetical you liberals want to bring up right and the my answer to your question hypothetical would be that, that, that he has to, he has to do that because he has religion, to bake the cake yeah, or he goes to jail finish play the reason why is because his free exercise of religion is not substantially burdened the key is substantially burdened and the compelling but that's your interest. that's your interpretation of it you don't know what his religious beliefs are well that's, you don't that, know if his religion teaches plugging. him now, look, I'm, I'm granting you that this could be a very, very slippery slope. You can have Satanists come in. You can have Sharia law people come in and, and radical Islamists come in. Uh, Lori, how do you answer that question? You know, I think that what I'd say is that what if you have a gay baker who doesn't want to bake a cake for the Westboro Baptist Church? Are we going to penalize him? Are we going to punish him for saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to use my free speech and I'm not going to support what you're doing? Is that the kind of country that uh, we're going to live in? Well, we here's the question, Lori. Isn't it, isn't it deeper than that? How pure are we to our uh, commitment to the First Amendment? In other words, if people have deeply held religious beliefs, where does that line get drawn? That line gets drawn when you have a compelling government interest. The government has to come in and be able to say, look, this is so important that we have to burden religious exercise here, and there's no other way that we can do it. There's no other option available. Most of the cases that you have under these RIFRAs have nothing to do with gay rights or any of those conflicts. Most of them are things like uh, the situation up in Philadelphia, where the city was trying to keep churches from feeding the homeless in public parks. Mm -hmm. You could have a food truck, but you couldn't serve the homeless. The city tried to shut them down. The church church took them to court under Pennsylvania's RIFRA, and the church has won. These are the kinds of cases that we should be talking about, not cases involving bakers or florists. All right, so let me then move on to the next point in this discussion here, Brian, and, and that has to do with uh, those people practicing their religion in America, and whether or not do you believe they have a, a complete right to practice it as they see fit? They, they don't. They don't. They don't. Let me tell you why. Because it, no, nobody's. Ta I, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but the, the the establishment clause in the First Amendment to our U.S. Constitution states very clearly, Sean, that the government cannot. Are you talking in. about the establishment clause? What about the free exercise thereof? It. 
But, but, but the Establishment Clause is important here because, in, in my opinion, I, I do constitutional law as well. In my opinion. We're not talking about a state established we, religion. We're talking about the free exercise thereof. It's a far more applicable clause. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do whatever you want. I'll just answer it in layman's terms. You can't do whatever you want based on whatever your religion says when it, when it might violate the tenets of our, of our Constitution. For example, possibly discriminating against somebody because of a sexual orientation, or, or for example, like the case that led to this law. All right, let me yeah. say, let's, let's say this. Let's say you know that um, you have sex offenders, right? Right. Well, I don't know what the offense is, but you have a registered sex offender. All right, and let's say that this registered sex offender is well-known in the neighborhood. The registered sex offender goes into the store, and the person doesn't want to want to serve them do they have the right because they believe it's what that person did is so offensive do they have a and they believe it's so against their moral compass teachings and values would they have a right not to serve them i i think they they would not have a right to not serve them because 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 their beliefs are not substantially impaired and and we have and and that the compelling state interest is commerce so the answer would be no they can't do that Lori. You know, I think that this gets at a really important issue, which is that we live in a society where not everybody agrees. We live in a society where we like to talk about freedom. We like to talk about diversity. How are we going to deal with those issues? Are we going to say, I'm sorry, government wins. You just have to do whatever we say. Or are we going to let people make their own decisions, live their own lives, run their own family businesses? I think we should do the latter. Let me ask this question, because I'm a little bit amazed. You know, there's been uh, a lot of us, uh, Brian, that have been speaking out against the treatment of gays and lesbians by radical Islamist states. You know, and um, that means the treatment of women, for example, in Saudi Arabia. Now, Hillary Clinton took millions and millions of dollars through the Clinton Foundation. Hillary Clinton tweeted out about the treatment of gays. Her husband signed this bill into law on a federal level in 93. She didn't criticize him back at the time. Do you think it's hypocritical? Because I have found the silence from women's groups and gay and lesbian groups almost deafening when it comes to life for gays and lesbians and women under Sharia law. So they're well, getting all worked up about Mike Pence and a similar law to that that Bill Clinton supported and Barack Obama supported. Do you see hypocrisy here? No, and here's why. You don't you know, see hypocrisy, well, really? Tell you why, because I know gays you don't are, want to, gays I know are being you. thrown off roofs no, and wait. being sentenced to death in these countries under Sharia. Really? Well... Well, you, look, you're, you're you don't question, think their silence is deafening there? Well, I, look, your question, your question asked me whether there's, there's hypocrisy as to Obama signing the off on the bill in Illinois and Clinton signing off on this in 1993. Why is there no hypocrisy? It's no hop hypocrisy because the context in which they signed that that is the lamest excuse. No, it's because not because the wording it is identical. No, it had it had yes, to do with, yes, the Sean, wording is Sean, identical. Sean, I went Sean. back. I have Bill Clinton in his own words when he signed the bill. What did he say? I'll play it for you. Play the cut three that I had from yesterday. It is high time we had an open and honest reaffirmation of the role of American citizens of faith. Not so that we can agree, but so that we can argue and discourse and seek the truth and seek to heal this troubled land. So today I ask you to also think of that. We are a people of faith. We have been so secure in that faith that we have enshrined in our Constitution protection for people who profess no faith and good for us for doing so that is what the first amendment is all about but let us never believe that the freedom of religion imposes on any of us some responsibility to run from our convictions let us instead respect one another's faiths fight to the death to preserve the right of every american to practice whatever convictions he or she has but bring our values back to the table of american discourse to heal our troubled land Thank you very much. He's making the case of Mike Pence and, and Asa Hutchinson. Right. Well, you, you, your point's well taken on that, but can I just... Offer so there is you? hypocrisy. I want to hear you say it. Yeah. There is hypocrisy. Well, based on what... Yeah, based on what Clinton just said there, there is. But can I just make one suggestion how you could clarify all this? It, let, let's solve the problem by putting in the legislation that you can't discriminate against... Well, that's what Mike Pence is going to do. And that's what Asa Hutchinson's going to do. If they're going to do that, I think then, we, we, then, then we're making progress then. All right. We what do you think? Progress. Last word, Lori. You know, I just want to say about this Establishment Clause argument that's been up to the Supreme Court three times now and three times it's failed. So the idea that uh, it would violate the Establishment Clause to protect our religious freedom uh, simply isn't correct. 
All right, guys, thank you for being with us. Appreciate the debate. We'll get to the, your calls on this and all the other issues of the day when we get back. 